Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we are revisiting the Ryzen 5 7600X by taking a look at one of the biggest points of contention with these new Zen 4 CPUs, the operating temperature, which is typically up around 95 degrees. Now, AMD has explained that this is by design and is intended, but that hasn't stopped the internet from drawing its own conclusions and assumptions. Now, I've heard and read countless different takes on this topic, and the one I wanted to hone in on with this content was the genuine concern that using anything less than a 360mm liquid cooler on the 7600X would see a significant performance loss. And after all, despite using the Be Quiet Pure Loop 2 FX 360mm liquid cooler, our 7600X still peaked at 93 degrees for an all-core workload, and that's an insane temperature for a 6-core CPU using a 360mm AIO. So based on that, it's not crazy to assume that when using an affordable air cooler, performance will tank due to thermal throttling, which sees a reduction in the operating frequency. So shortly after completing my 7600X review, I decided to do some testing. And while I have significantly more Zen 4 cooler testing planned, this is an appetizer or a for science type test, if you will. I decided that it might be entertaining to throw AMD's older Wraith Spire box cooler on the 7600X, just to see how poorly it would run. And I have to say the results are extremely surprising and not at all what I was expecting. And around the same time that I was trying to burn up my 7600X with AMD's box cooler, there was a lot of talk floating around the internet of AMD's eco mode, as well as the PBO2 curve optimizer with a negative voltage. So I expanded the scope of the testing to look at not just how the 7600X behaved with the AMD box cooler, but also how the 65W eco mode worked, as well as the PBO2 curve optimizer. And I did this testing with both the box cooler and the 360mm liquid cooler. As usual, we have quite a bit of data to go over, but before we do that, let's talk about the eco mode and PBO2. AMD's eco mode simply enforces a power limit, so rather than let the 7600X run at full power, which we observed as 86 watts for the cores, it limits the core power to 65 watts, so a rather substantial 24% drop in power there. Now, this certainly won't improve performance, if anything, it'll reduce it, but the hope is that it'll only slightly reduce performance while massively reducing thermals. Then we have the PBO2 curve optimizer with a negative voltage, and this can be thought of more as like overclocking, but kind of in the other direction. So that is to say your mileage will vary, and ensuring stability can be quite tricky. The curve optimizer is an adaptive voltage and frequency scaling feature, which can either be set to increase or decrease voltage from the stock setting. And I'm not going to show you how to enable this feature here, at least not in detail. For that, I recommend checking out an excellent video from Ali over at Optimum Tech. It really is a great video that shows the process well, and I'll link it below. Now, in the case of Zen 4, you do want to reduce the voltage as these CPUs are thermally limited, not power limited. Lowering the voltage reduces thermals and therefore buys you more frequency headroom. This, however, can and likely will introduce stability issues as the CPU doesn't always have enough voltage for the target frequency. And adding another layer of complexity is the fact that not all silicon is equal. For example, what my 7600X can achieve in terms of undervolting could be wildly different from your CPU if you have one or most other CPUs. It might be much better or perhaps it might be much worse. And I guess the point is at this point in time, it's really impossible to say what the expectation here is. It's also extremely difficult to validate an undervolt, and to do so with any degree of accuracy would take at minimum days of stress testing. For example, my 7600X accepted the maximum undervolt value of negative 30. It loaded straight into Windows without an issue, and I began testing. After an hour of looping Cinebench R23, things looked really good, thermals were down, and the performance had actually improved. Pretty amazing stuff. Gaming also appeared to enjoy a nice performance bump, so things were getting very exciting. But then I tried to run the Blender benchmark, and within minutes the application crashed a desktop. And after several tries, I reverted back to the BIOS defaults, and the stability issues went away. So I tried a negative 25 offset, still no joy. Negative 20 was no good either, and negative 15 also failed. In fact, it wasn't until I went for a negative 10 offset that the system now appeared completely stable. But I should stress that I'm yet to run multiple different loads for days on end, so I can't say for sure that it is 100% stable. I've since tried all four of my Zen 4 CPUs and none of them are 100% stable using a negative 30 offset. Most will handle Cinebench R23 without an issue, 
but applications like Blender will crash. And this is on the MSI X670E Ace, as well as the Gigabyte X670E Master. So I've tried two really high quality boards there and got the same results both times. So based on my limited testing, negative 10 to negative 15 appears achievable, but again, I've not done the appropriate level of stress testing to say for sure that they're 100% stable under all conditions. So going into this, I just wanted to make it very clear that undervolting should very much be viewed in the same light as overclocking. You're running the CPU out of spec and depending on the silicon quality, your mileage will vary. And just because the configuration appears stable after running some games and benchmarks, it doesn't actually mean it's 100% stable and won't let you down at the most inconvenient of times. And there's also a good reason for why AMD runs these Zen 4 CPUs at the voltages they do. They're not adding excessive voltage just for the sake of it. They know exactly what these CPUs require for maximum stability. Now for testing, I'm using our standard AM5 test system, which is built inside the Be Quiet Silent Base 802. The GeForce RTX 3090 Ti has been used along with 32 gigabytes of DDR5 6000 CL30 memory. And for cooling, we have the Be Quiet Pure Loop 2 FX 360 millimeter liquid cooler along with the AMD Wraith Spire, and I'm using the original Spire with the copper slug. Okay, let's get into the results. Starting with the Cinebench R23 multi-core results, let's first compare the stock 105 watt behavior. Here the 7600X scored 15,204 points, which was shown in our day one review. And now using the Wraith Spire, we see a 5% drop in performance to 14,408 points, as the sustained clock frequency dropped by 3%, and the operating temperature increased from 93 degrees up to 101 degrees, which is obviously very hot, but I was shocked to see the all-core performance drop by a mere 5%. So rather than try and cap the processor at 95 degrees, it's allowing the 7600X to exceed 100 degrees to avoid heavy throttling. Now, with Eco Mode enabled, which are the 65 watt results, we see that with the 360 millimeter AIO, the peak operating temperature has dropped by 16 degrees, which is huge. And yet all this cost us was 50 megahertz, resulting in a mere 1.5% drop in performance. It also improved the performance with the Wraith Spire, while also reducing the operating temperature by 7 degrees. And now the 7600X is just 4% slower than the review configuration, just 4% slower and a degree warmer while using the box cooler. That is pretty nuts. Now, looking at the undervolt results, we see with the 360 millimeter liquid cooler that things have improved. Not massively, but even with a negative 10 offset, we're still seeing a seven degree drop in operating temperature with a 100 megahertz boost to the sustained operating frequency. And this did improve performance by roughly 2%. Certainly nothing to write home about when it comes to performance, but the fact that this was achieved while reducing temperatures is very good. It's a similar story with the Wraith Spire box cooler. We're now looking at comparable performance to that of the stock behavior at 105 watts, though temperatures are still up by five degrees. So this means for the 7600X, just enabling the eco mode will provide the best temperature results while not compromising stability, while undervolting will generally improve performance and slightly lower temperatures from the stock configuration. Both are certainly good options, but neither are amazing. They don't drastically improve how the 7600X performs. Meanwhile, the single core performance is barely affected, moving in either direction from the stock configuration by no more than a percent. So what that means is for the most part, I expect gaming performance should be largely unaffected. Here's a quick look at Blender for those of you interested. I won't break down all of this data again as the trends are quite similar to what we just saw when looking at Cinebench. What I will say though is when using the Wraith Spire, this will result in about a 4% performance hit. So again, a pretty negligible difference really. And here's a look at total system power usage in Blender. Stock the 7600X pushed the total usage to 226 watts. And with the Wraith Spire, that figure came down to 211 watts as the higher operating temperature saw the operating frequency slightly decrease. Eco mode doesn't make a huge difference here, though we are seeing a 13% reduction in total system usage, which makes sense given the CPU itself saw a 24% reduction. Then with the undervolting, we saw total system usage drop by 7%, but remember the operating frequency, temperature and performance was increased, so it is a net gain here. Now, time for the gaming benchmarks, and starting with Watch Dogs Legion, we see that performance using the Eco mode is basically identical to what we saw stock. So at the very least, gamers will want to enable that mode. 
For the best results though, undervolting does look like the way to go. Using the Wraith Spire, we saw a 3% boost and a 5% boost for the 360mm liquid cooler. So that's a nice gain. It's certainly not massive, but a 5% boost for free while also reducing power and thermals, that's a good result. The Rainbow Six Extraction performance was also much the same. This time, at best, we received a 2% boost via undervolting. So not exactly exciting, and again, at the very least, enabling eco mode is the way to go for 7600X owners. And this is certainly true if you're worried about the high operating temperatures of the stock mode. Hitman 3 showed more of the same. Performance for the most part went unchanged between the various configurations. Tiny Tina's Wonderlands was already heavily GPU bound using the 7600X, so no change here, and these results will apply to the vast majority of gaming scenarios. Okay, so rather than talk about every game individually, because I did retest all 12 games, I'll just show you the rest of the results on screen. In short, there's very little difference between these various configurations when gaming, and there are a few reasons for this. Firstly, when gaming, the 7600X generally doesn't come close to reaching the maximum power draw, and in fact, when limited to 65 watts, it will more often than not still be operating below that. And this means, as a result, when gaming, the 7600X won't be pegged at over 90 degrees, like what we see in all core workloads, such as Blender and Cinebench R23. Rather, for the vast majority of the games, the temperatures will be significantly lower, and we'll take a look at that. For example, here's a look at F122, after an hour of looping the built-in benchmark. For the most part, the temperature hovered between 40 to 50 degrees with the occasional and very brief spike into the 60s. Total CPU package power was often in the low 50 watt range, with core power just over 20 watts. So when compared to all core workloads, the power draw and temperatures are significantly lower in F122. Cyberpunk 2077 is much more CPU demanding, and here the package power typically stayed above 80 watts, but even so, temperatures were still miles off the 93 degrees seen in Cinebench R23, typically hovering around 63 degrees with occasional and very brief spikes over 70 degrees. Hitman 3 power usage ranged between 60 to 75 watts for the bulk of our testing, and this resulted in operating temperatures in the range of 50 to 60 degrees, and again, all of these games were left for an hour to heat up the CPU and do their thing. So it's a little bit hotter than F122, but less than Cyberpunk 2077. Spider-Man Remastered, which is another very heavy CPU user, this push package power to around 82 watts for an operating temperature of about 60 degrees. So a similar result to what was seen in Cyberpunk. Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, again, isn't a very CPU demanding game. And here we saw similar behavior to that of F122. Typically, package power hovered just above 50 watts with operating temperatures ranged between 45 to 50 degrees. And the last game we'll take a look at is Counter-Strike Global Offensive. This isn't a core heavy game, but it does push the CPU quite hard with hundreds of frames per second. And this saw package power generally around 50 watts for a typical operating temperature of just shy of 50 degrees. So there's a bit to go over here, and I guess we'll start with the eco mode, which is really nothing more than a power limit. It did work quite well with the 7600X, dropping temperatures substantially with a good cooler, and it had almost no impact on performance. How different this will be with the 170 watt models depends on things like power limits, and right now the one-click option in the Ryzen Master software does enforce a 65 watt limit regardless of which model you use, but motherboards are now also getting this feature which you can enable in the BIOS, and I expect there to be a range of power options there. So I'll probably explore that a bit more in the future. A similar method is to just force a hard temperature limit. It's essentially the same thing as eco mode. The power limit is just a bit more dynamic depending on your cooling performance, but overall the results will be similar to that of eco mode. Undervolting with PBO2 is a neat trick, though as I've explained, there are a few major caveats here. Firstly, depending on the silicon quality, the results could be great, they could be okay, or they could be very unimpressive. This is not a universally proven method. The other important issue is of course stability. Stress testing to the degree where you can be satisfied that the system is 100% stable under all conditions takes time and experience. And if you simply can't afford crashes, I'd say for most it's just not going to be worth the risk, but of course that will be for you to decide. I think what shocked me the most about this testing was how well the 7600X performed with the Wraith Spire. Sure, the temperatures using the stock configuration were very high, but it worked and again performance was great. 
Then with a little bit of tweaking or by simply enabling the eco mode, it was very usable. Again, temps were high, but we were now in AMD's safe range. More importantly, this means using an affordable tower style cooler is very possible and will lead to much better results than what we saw with the AMD box cooler. It's also very important to note that the 95 degree results shown for the Zen 4 CPUs are recorded running stressful all core workloads and really don't apply to a gaming situation. Using the exact same configuration that resulted in a 95 degree temperature in Cinebench R23 saw on average just a 60 degree operating temperature when gaming and for many games the temperature will be considerably less. Personally I don't find the high operating temperatures of Zen 4 CPUs to be all that of a big deal. By monitoring how they behave, it's quite obvious AMD's not lying, rather the CPUs are operating as intended, and as process nodes continue to increase in density, I believe this sort of behavior will be normalized. In my opinion, the real issue for Zen 4 are the platform costs, things we've already talked about in our reviews. The CPUs themselves are already quite expensive, but it's the absurd price of AM5 motherboards that really hurts their value, along with the need for expensive premium DDR5 memory. The only good news here being that both issues will almost certainly be solved in time, but for now you're simply best off waiting, and again that was my recommendation in all four of my Zen 4 reviews. Anyway, I'm going to get back to testing, there is far too much work on right now, and that's just talking about Zen 4. I still want to provide a detailed cooler guide, I've got X670 motherboards, B650 motherboards, all the VRM testing to be done there, and yeah, well, there's just much more stuff. But before that, we have quite a few GPUs to check out. So make sure you are subscribed for that. You're not going to want to miss it. And if you've enjoyed this video, you know what to do. Also, we have Patreon Floatplane. Subscribe to either one of those. You'll get more Harbor Unbox goodness. It'll give you access to our exclusive Discord server, monthly live streams of Tim and myself, Q&As, and behind the scenes content. Tim has just about moved into his new studio, so he'll start pumping out some content soon. So that'll be good. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.